Hello, welcome Jack and welcome everybody. Uh, Jack has got what I would have thought would have been two dream jobs in his uh, CV so far. I wonder where he'll end up. This is quite fascinating. He started with Surfers Against Sewage after doing a degree in marine geography. I don't even know what that is, but it sounds exactly the kind of thing I would like to have studied had it been available. Um, and so he worked with them with SAS for about nine years um, and included something called, I think it's called Million Mile Clean. There you are. So he had great ambitions. And that involved the Plastic Free North Devon, our friends. And uh, I think it's still ongoing. So he might tell us a bit about that as well. And then after nine there, years there, he joined uh, West Country Rivers Trust uh, to work with the volunteer citizen scientists, which is something we all think we kind of are. So we want to know more about that. We want to know more about what the West Country Rivers Trust does. And we want to know more about what our water is up to, because there's lots of local interest in the quality of our water. Uh, so we've given him a brief to talk about uh, water quality from stream to sea, which seems quite a big brief to me, but not to a man who can cope with a million miles. So <laughs> I'm going to say <laughs> over to you, Jack, and thank you very much for coming so early on in your a few months into your new career. Awesome. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the for the welcome, Paula. Um, as Paula said, my name's Jack, and I'm the Citizen Science and Volunteer Coordinator at West Country Rivers Trust. Um, I joined in November last year after having spent nine and a half years leading the community and events team at Surfers Against Sewage. So my background is very much in <clears throat> the citizen side of citizen science, sort of the, the social sciences, if you will, community mobilization, um, volunteer growth. Um, as Paula said, I uh, co-founded and led on our Million Mile Clean at Surfers Against Sewage, which was, um, in essence, uh, trying to mobilise 100,000 people to each clean 10 miles of blue, green or urban space through the year. Um, we launched it in 2021, and I think we reached 142,000 people and 1.1 million miles. So very ambitious, um, but the appetite of the public sort of outdid even us, which was great. Um, after having been there for so long, I, I obviously wanted a change. Um, I wanted to stay within the environment sector and stay within sort of the people movement. And West Country Rivers Trust had an amazing opportunity to join their, well, to, I guess, to, to be the, the sole person leading their citizen science investigations and their volunteer offering. Um, so our, our citizen science investigations is the name for our volunteer sort of water quality monitoring program. Um, and it was started about six years ago and has gone from strength to strength since. We currently have, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail later on in the presentation. Um, we currently have three, well, actually just under 400 people actively out every month taking samples from their water, water from their local water body, um, but also 850 people signed up to the program overall. So a lot of those are within the last few months, so kind of haven't yet got the equipment or got around to doing their first test. Um, but it, the, the appetite again is there. And I know that as um, sort of the, the general knowledge and public awareness around rivers, around water quality and around how everything upstream affects the sea, I know it's going to keep growing. So I've kind of come in to manage uh, the program itself, but also look at ways that we can make the growth sustainable and kind of increase our offering to really ensure that the data being collected by volunteers, by all of you, you know, goes somewhere and brings about real tangible change. Um, my contact details are at the top of this email here. Please do feel free to, to email me or, or, you know, drop me a, a line or, or call me at any point. You know, I'm the one person in the office running this program, um, but I do have a team that kind of dip in and out. So there's enough of us to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk through a few things in this, this talk today. The first one is obviously West Country Rivers Trust ourselves, uh, who we are, kind of what, how we're made up, and then how that fits into the, the bigger Rivers Trust picture. Um, I'm going to talk through threats to our rivers. Obviously, most of us know all of those already. Um, I'm going to talk through our citizen science in, uh, investigations and kind of our, our volunteer offering in more detail, including some of the processes and systems we use, such as cartographer. Um, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Obviously, virtually, we can't do a practical, um, but I'll talk through all the equipment we provide and kind of make it as easy as possible. So West Country Rivers Trust 
is the largest and uh, most long-standing rivers trust in the UK. We were founded, I think it's about 28 years ago, um, and we currently have 80 members of staff. So a really big organization, um, and they're spread out across five main teams. So one of our biggest teams is it's our land team, um, and that's made up of farm advisors who are specialists in working with farms and other landowners to implement best practices and kind of make sure that farmers know what is the most sustainable option and then have the opportunities and the resources to achieve those. Um, so things like uh, tree planting, um, you know, educating around sort of slurry pits, uh, plastic pollution, that sort of thing. We also have a big rivers team, obviously, as our name suggests, um, and they work on things like fish migration, uh, bankside clearances, um, that sort of thing, a lot of habitat work, you know, so they're out of the office the vast majority of the time actually in rivers, you know, carrying out work to, to ensure that they flow um, as they should. I sit within our evidence and engagement team, so I think this is one of our fastest growing teams, um, and this again is sort of semi divided within it. So we have a big monitoring and mapping team who work with GIS to kind of uh, overlay a lot of the data that we collect um, and use that for people at the Environment Agency um, to help dictate where their monitoring takes place. Um, we also have our engagement side of things, so citizen science investigations, where I sit, and obviously our, our education work as well. At the moment, those are two separate entities, but one of the main things I've seen since starting in November is the, the opportunity to um, combine them and roll sort of citizen science out to younger generations, both in schools and colleges, but also things like Duke of Edinburgh um, and uh, Scouts as well. We then have our comms and marketing team, which is relatively self-explanatory. You know, they're in charge of our social media offering, um, events, and then obviously our shop as well. So we recently signed up to T-Mill, which is a zero waste, environmentally friendly clothing, well, I guess apparel shop um, based on the Isle of Wight, uh, where everything is done in-house. So rather than a lot of other shops that, um, you know, environmental charities are forced to use where you have to put large orders in to, to make it financially viable, uh, T-Mill can produce one-offs because they have the creation and the printing press in-house. So rather than there being, you know, a surplus of, I don't know, XXXLs or, you know, XXX small, you know, extra, extra small clothing, we can basically uh, order to the orders we're getting in. So we can order to demand, which means that waste is, is absolutely minimized. Um, and then finally, we have our central services team. So finance, HR, health and safety, that sort of thing. Um, we're based in, or our head office is in Stoke Climsland, so just outside Launceston in Cornwall. But with 80 staff members and a huge growth since the pandemic, there's absolutely no way we could all fit in the office. So the vast majority of us work from home, um, heading into the office as and when it's needed. As I said, we are the biggest and most long-standing uh, Rivers Trust in the UK. There are now, I think, just over 80 Rivers Trusts um, across, across the UK and Ireland. We have one governing body uh, that's called the Rivers Trust, and then they kind of, they're the umbrella that um, ensures collaboration, uh, helps us get funding, and rolls out their own campaigns through the Rivers Trusts. Um, the Rivers Trust vary sort of I guess exponentially, you know, as I said, we're up to 80. In fact, I think we're slightly over 80 staff members now, um, and we've been going for over 25 years. Um, a couple of Rivers Trust, especially in Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland, were founded in the tail, so the last quarter of last year. And as far as I was I'm aware, um, have one full time staff member and then rely on volunteers. So the kind of the the size and spread of these these Rivers Trusts is is huge. Um, a lot of them, as you'll see on this map, are kind of focused predominantly around river catchment areas. So we're quite rare in that we cover the entire West Country. So Cornwall, Devon, Somerset and parts of Dorset. Um, a lot of the other rivers trust focus specifically on actual catchments. So places like uh, the River Ribble Rivers Trust, you know, they focus on the Ribble and, and the catchments, the tributaries, that sort of thing. So we are quite rare, um, but they are, well, every few months there's another Rivers Trust that sort of appears and, and joins, the, joins the collaborative uh, organization network. As I'm sure we're all aware, um, the importance of our rivers and water bodies has become a real part of public conscience since COVID. It's estimated now that more people uh, swim in inland waterways than they do the coast, um, and yet it's sort of beaches and the sea that are uh, 
I guess the, the pinnacle of water quality, you know, they're the ones that have the protection, they're the ones that have designated bathing waters, they're the ones we see in the news and in social media when something goes wrong, and yet a lot of the pollutants and issues faced by the coast start inland and are coming down the rivers, um, and our rivers are underprotected, um, under, sort of, sort of misunderstood, um, and we want to do a big piece of work, obviously raising awareness around them. Recreation, as I just said, is one of the key sort of important things we use our rivers for, but also habitats. A lot of the species endemic to the UK can only be found in our inland waterways, um, and the more uh, issues that we um, as humans place on them, the more species we are losing without, without really ever understanding them. Drinking water is another real important part of, uh, well, important thing we get from our inland waterways, and I think the drought last summer proved that, um, proved that really well, a good backing for this talk. And then obviously health and well-being. Uh, blue, and in our case, I suppose, green and brown health has obviously become a real um, drive uh, since the pandemic. And there's now social prescribers who prescribe time in nature, time spent on rivers and time spent in the sea as a means of dealing with sort of low level anxiety and depression. So the importance of rivers is, is huge um, to both humans, to ecosystems and to nature itself. Um, so there are a number of issues that our waterways face, um, and I know we're all familiar with them. Um, the issues that the West Country faces are predominantly rural, but I will come on obviously to, to urban as well. Things like slurry spreading before heavy, heavy rain, fine sediment from soil erosion, soil compaction, uh, pesticides, livestock in rivers, and then obviously macro and microplastics. Um, and all of these measures can be mitigated um, and that's kind of where our farm and, and land teams come in, you know, working with farmers to, um, well, to, to stop all of these issues happening or to, to Im implement best practices that, you know, it, when slurry needs to be spread, it's not spread before heavy rain, you know, it's spread against the gradient. There's, um, I'll come on to it in a bit, but there's buffer zones between, you know, heavy farmland and the river itself, that sort of thing. Macro and microplastics are obviously a huge issue that I know is, is kind of, um, right, uh, right at the front of the public conscience. So that's one of the easier issues to tackle. People are very aware of, of, of that and what they can do. But some of these other ones, you know, fine sediment, especially and soil compaction, um, they're not quite as fancy, should we say. So it, it's a lot harder to get people behind and supporting them. This is uh, one of our educational tools that we take into schools. Um, and it's a very simplified uh, uh, model, I suppose, for what a good farm or, or, or a farm implementing best practices and a farm implementing worst practices look like. The best farm, the good farm is obviously on this side um, and you've got things like uh, very defined areas for slurry. Um, the livestock have a, have an area they're allowed in the water, but it's fenced off, you know, and, and, and it's, it's again, um, there, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, yeah, a very specified way of doing it. Where there is um, heavy sort of um, uh, planting, it's done away from the river against the gradient. You've got what's called a riparian buffer strip, which I think is, uh, well, is the, the two meter buffer zone, minimum two meter buffer zone between any work going on on the farm and the river itself kind of planted along here. Um, and then you've got the, the livestock themselves spread out across, across fields rather than um, down here where it's you know, very densely populated. So the right hand side is what we would call a good farm and um, the left hand side obviously not so. So you've got coast uh, riverine erosion going across the banks, you've got a slurry pit leaking directly into the river, you've got a massive pile of tyres again leaching any chemicals into the river here. The pathways and streams aren't protected whatsoever and you've got maize planted um, very densely again well, with the gradient right up to the river so any um, fertilizer or pesticides used here when it rains will go straight into the river as I said a very simplified form um, and it's obviously not as easy as this in real life but it kind of shows some ways that um, our land team can go in and, and, and help farmers and, and landowners sort of implement best practices to protect the waterways that are that are running through their land less relevant down in here in the southwest but obviously some of our rivers do run through uh urban areas that i guess the, the tamar in the x flowing through plymouth and exeter are kind of the two biggest examples of that the two biggest urban uh, areas within our our catchment area itself um and you've got things like road runoff um which is a huge issue in terms of both sort of uh, oil plastic pollution uh, anything like that on roads but also tires 
you know we, we regularly change the tires on our car we know they're worn down but as of yet there's no um no scientific papers looking into the impacts that that rubber has once it gets into rivers and waterways uh, sewage discharge sewer overflows combined sewer overflows are obviously very uh, important at the moment and the work surface against sewage and people like fergal sharkey have been doing has really has raised this and you know challenged organizations such as southwest water to do more um, barriers to fish migration you know that's something that our land team work uh, sorry that our rivers team work on kind of um, building fish passes uh, or demolishing if, if needs be bank restoration you know allowing rivers to flow freely um, and animals to or fish to, to migrate um, as they should industrial runoff not something huge down here in the southwest but obviously something that we have to be aware of and then plastic pollution um, as discussed and again you know with with well plastic free north devon is a good example you know river cleans are, are a huge part of what they do similarly with surface against sewage and us at west country rivers trust you know we are monitoring the water quality but we're also getting involved in river cleans and, and, and getting rid of the, the plastic pollution um, that we find there another uh, very simplified version um, and i will caveat this by saying it's never as black and white as this this uh, image shows you know i think if we were to see this city I, I definitely wouldn't be able to afford to live there but this is the ideal sort of comparison between what a good city looks like what a good urban area and what a bad urban area and again you've got very obvious things here so the buildings have solar panels on them you've got a lot more greenery better um better drainage you know you can see on this this bad city uh, with inverted commas there's a lot of standing water you've got a buffer zone again a riparian buffer zone between you know the the sort of anthropogenic uh, areas and then the river itself whereas down in the bad city here everything from industry to housing to roads goes right up to the to the river anything that goes on here is going to impact the river straight away um you've got public transport up on in the good city and then obviously more cars and, uh, and single use uh, single driving going on down here so again this just highlights absolute best practices and you know things that i guess city planners can can think of to protect the river even while building a city and then you've got the bad side of things down here moving on then more to to the sort of the topic of our our, our talk here this is um a, a couple of diagrams taken from the environment agency website so basically this shows uh phosphate testing done in north devon uh during well from 2000 and then from 2013 to 2020 so what you can see here is that in 2000 in the year 2000 there were 1443 phosphate tests carried out in north devon across 122 unique sites Fast forward to 2020, and this has been reduced from 1,443 to 43 tests conducted across 19 sites. So obviously 2020 was the start of the pandemic, so there are um, other factors that come into play here. But what you can see is the trajectory was always going down. And the purpose of this slide is to show that since, to, since the year 2000, the Environment Agency has had their budgets cut drastically, um, their resources, their capacity, everything has sort of fallen off a cliff. And this is the result. It's not a case of, or it's not necessarily just a case of, you know, us not being able to pick up on uh, water quality and sewage incidents. It's the fact that with this huge decrease in testing, we no longer understand the overall health of our rivers and we don't understand when things are bad. You know, if we're only conducting 43 tests through the year at 19 sites, that's not giving us anywhere near enough data to understand when things go wrong or, or what a healthy river should look like. That's where citizen science can come in. So citizen science is uh, predominantly used to raise awareness of issues and, and it's very much a case of um, quantity of data. So rather than uh, you know, paid monitoring officers going out um, you know, when they have the time, we're, you know, we're trying to recruit hundreds, if not thousands of people to, to be testing their water quality every month um, and to give us that data and to give us that overall picture of of water body health um, while also raising awareness you know so if you're out uh, at your local stream or, or tributary or river testing the water quality and someone sees you you know you've got the equipment we provide chances are they're going to be interested you know they they start talking to you and it has that domino effect that just by being out there collecting the water quality samples you start talking to people they want to get involved or they suddenly understand that oh the river's not as clean as i thought it was let's get involved um 
as I said, it gives us this, this better understanding of overall health of our rivers. Uh, when low level pollution incidents do occur, because we've got that data now, you know, to back up um, water body health, we can alert the authorities. So this is kind of the, the biggest thing we're working on currently is how citizen science and how the work we're doing feeds into models for people like Environment Agency and Southwest Water, but also challenges local authorities and uh, landowners to do better. Um, mental health and well-being are heavily sort of linked with citizen science. You know, during the pandemic, people reconnected with the natural environment when we were allowed the one piece of exercise uh, a day during 2020, the first lockdown. Um, I think people really realised, if they hadn't already, how important the environment is to our mental health and well-being. And, and after that, you know, they suddenly started to realise it, it's very hard to enjoy nature without realising the effects and the impacts that, that we're having on it. And that naturally leads to wanting to protect it, which is where we come in. And then education and information. The more people that are aware of the issues faced by rivers, the more information and data we're collecting, the more we can do with it, the more uh, hopefully we can bring about real tangible change. Uh, this is just a, another sort of uh, brief overview of the benefits of citizen science. So the amount of monthly data and the geospatial and temporal coverage that we're getting um, it is huge and sort of far exceeds anything the Environment Agency or, or other uh, governing bodies would be able to. It's relatively low cost, you know, we're not paying staff time to, you know, uh, for actual um, employee people to, to, to go out and monitor the river, you know, people are doing it off, off their own back and on a voluntary basis, and we kind of provide the equipment um, and the platforms for them to, to uh, provide that information to us. Um, engagement and community cohesion. So what we're looking to do more so, and this is a really good point that's already been raised today, is not just have you out as volunteers collecting your, you know, the water quality from your, your specific area, but link you up as a, a sort of catchment based community. So, you know, those of you down at the estuary know exactly what's going on right at the source of your, your stream or river because you're connected with them and you all feel part of a bigger community that's collecting, you know, vital data from source to sea to really have an effect and to challenge sort of local MPs, authorities, water bodies um, to the highest level. So moving on to West Country uh, citizen science investigations. So at the moment, this is our volunteer offering. Um, one of the biggest things that I've been working on is bringing in um, other sort of data, data collection methods. So things like river fly, um, kick sampling, river cleans, so that when we ask people to volunteer for us, you know, that they don't have to do one thing, they can choose sort of a suite of engagement um, opportunities all the data goes into one place and then that's kind of that's what we use um so the biggest thing with west country citizen science investigations is that we're not necessarily looking for pollution events although obviously we're set up to deal with them when they come in we're trying to build long-term geotemporal and spatial data sets that give us a better picture of what our rivers should look like what a good river stream uh, tributary is that then when something goes wrong we have the data to back up that it has gone wrong um so a lot of people come to me and say you know i've been volunteering for a year uh the levels have always been the same i've never found anything wrong should i find somewhere else and, and that's absolutely not what we want people to do we want to build up an understanding of of, of all the rivers and, and the, the general water bodies through the West Country um, so that we know when something has gone wrong. So when people sign up to West Country Citizen Science Investigations, we have a very easy step-by-step -step process for them to come on board. Um, as I said, I am the only full-time staff member working on this, um, but there's a team of three other people that are kind of working on the inbox, um, you know, working on the onboarding journey, uh, processing and analyzing the data, that sort of thing. So on our website, and, and I can share the link after this, we have a, an interactive manual that has everything you need to know to, to sign up to the process, what we're doing, where your data goes, you know, what sort of ownership you, excuse me, you have over it, um, and what the general aims are of the program, along with FAQs, um, and things like talking you through what equipment we provide and, and how it's used. But there are always people on hand on the phone or on email to answer questions and, you know, to really make you feel valued and part of something bigger. Cool. 
So what is recorded? So because this is citizen science, um, what we record is as simple as it possibly can be. Um, on the left here, you will see the form. So when you sign up to the program, we provide all the equipment for you uh, free of charge. And then we obviously have the forms for what data we want you to collect. So from the, and I use the term loosely, science side of things, um, we collect uh, data on total dissolved solids and temperature using the, um, the, the probe here. Um, which is again very simple to use. Uh, we do uh, we collect turbidity, so we have um, a Secchi tube here that again is all pre pre prepared and made before sending to you. And then finally, we collect phosphate readings. Um, so with the phosphate, we provide you with just over two years worth of strips, um, and then it's a case it, it's a sort of colorimetric chart. So you put the strips into the the sample of water you collect from your river, wait for it to settle, and then it's about color matching the uh, color of the water against the sort of the parts per billion um, that's indicated here. So all very simple to use on their own. You know, none of it necessarily tells you anything about the bigger picture of your river or, or, or stream. But the more data you collect over a longer period of time, the more we start to see patterns and we really start to see what it should look like and, and you know, when things go wrong. Alongside that, we ask for a lot of uh, sort of anecdotal and visual data, and this is just as important, you know, as the um, as the scientific uh, data that we're asking you to collect. So things like um, uh, invasive non-native species, um, if you smell or see a sewage pollution incident, you know, high levels of plastic pollution. Um, or generally things like stream flow, you know, if it's a lot lower than it's been in the past. Uh, which obviously with the drought through the summer, you know, caused caused quite a lot of worry and caused our phosphate readings to go through the roof. Um, and then wildlife as well. You know, if you have been collecting data for a year and for the first 11 months, you know, you, you often see uh, water voles or kingfishers or, or herons down there. And suddenly, you know, you're getting a smell of pollution and there's no wildlife. You know, we want to know that. that that's how we... You know, that's how we start to form a case study of, of what's gone wrong. And that's where our photos are important. And we always ask people to upload photos. So it helps us build a picture of, of what's going on at your, the water body as well. Um, so this form is obviously we provide it, we provide you with this form so you re can record everything when you're at the, 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 the river or stream itself. But this then is also online. So you can then uh, put all this data into, and I think it's the next slide. Yes into Cartographer, which is a sort of mapping and data storage tool we use. Um, and that's how we get the data. So you record everything at the stream site and then you are, yeah, upload it onto Cartographer and we see it in the back end. So this map here just shows our West Country CSI data that we've collected over the last few months. So all of those yellow dots are where we've had data um, submitted. You can see there are, especially on sort of, I guess the moorland areas, there are some big gaps in the data. And obviously if I were to zoom in further, um, you'd be able to see that there's a lot, there's a lot more gaps. It is, um, I think there's 850 water bodies within the West Country region that we cover. Um, and we use a sort of ARC GIS uh, mapping tool, um, along with a bit of Google Maps usage that uh, provides us with the total optimum number of sampling spots across those 850 water bodies. Um, and that takes into things like, uh, takes into account things like the length of the river, uh, population density, um, farms, that sort of thing. And basically that program has estimated that there are 4,000 potential sampling spots across the West Country that would give us the sort of optimum uh, water body knowledge. So we're on, well, 400 people so we've got a bit of a way to go but hopefully uh, through talks like this we can we can get there once we get your data and so the data you collect is yours you know you have ownership over that it's kind of for you to use to uh well for, for whatever you want what we want to do what we try and do with it is turn it into information turn it into something that's more communicatable and more understandable so at the moment we are producing this these which are called scorecards um, that take into account a year's worth of data from the water body and uh, sort of explain more um, what that means, you know, so to the general public. So working against sort of guidelines from the Environment Agency and, and uh, various environmental uh, directives, we give the water body an overall sort of health score. Um, and that takes into account all of the science uh, data that's been collected, but also, um, you know, the anecdotal and, and observational stuff I said as well. And then goes into a bit more data, a bit, bit more detail around the actual readings you collect. So phosphate stability, dissolved solids and temperature. This is one of the areas that we're looking to um, sort of update 
and, and make more robust uh, in the next, well, I guess over the, the course of the next year. So this is what it currently looks like, um, but it, it, it will be uh, tweaked slightly in the coming months. So this is, um, these are two diagrams that I pulled this morning from the Environment Agency's uh, Catchment Data Explorer. Um, basically, it is a uh, website that the Environment Agency hosts that <clears throat> gives you uh, information of the overall catchment. Once you go into there, you know, you can find uh, 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 the overall health of the water body. You can find the, the, the main issues faced by it. You can find what work has been done, uh, where the landowners, uh, landowners are and who's responsible. But for the purposes of this talk, I kind of just wanted to use it to highlight the catchment based approach that we're talking about. So at no point do we look at rivers um, as just the river itself. You know, these maps show that, that that just wouldn't work at all. You've got to look at the tributaries, the, the streams, the sources, the land use in the entire catchment to give you that bigger picture. So more often than not, we're, we're not actually recommending people go to, um, you know, the, the main river. We're looking at uh, the tributaries and, and, and the small streams that feed into it to give us that overall picture of water body health. This then um, is the map I was talking about earlier, the ArcGIS map. This shows the number of potential CSI sites uh, across um, the North Devon catchment. Um, the red sites are where we currently have people sampling and the blue sites are where we don't have anybody but would like to fill them. So this shows that we have a, a good population, a good community within North Devon. Um, although I think we can probably discard this one in the middle of the sea there, uh, but that we still have work to do. And, you know, we, we really do have gaps that we'd like to fill uh, um, right across North Devon. And obviously, hopefully that's where that's where this talk today will help with. The process we have for signing people up then is um, that people email us at West Country Rivers Trust and then the team can recommend sites closest to where you are. This is... Um, not a, a sort of a perfect system you know it, it's basically a couple of people in the office using ArcGIS looking on Google Maps trying to find the key access points so it doesn't always work so we're very willing to work with you uh, as the local community on the ground to update uh, our sample points you know so if we were to say if we were rec to recommend you know this site here for example um, and you were to go out have a look at it and say it's totally inaccessible and it's on private land how about you know we, we choose somewhere closer to my house we're much we're, we're more than willing to work with that and kind of update our system so that the sample spots we have are as relevant as they possibly can be all right that was um that's the end of my talk obviously um hand back to to paula and for, for talks what i will say um is if anyone can spot the invasive non-native species on this slide um i'll be very impressed <laughs>